Amen. So the title of the sermon this evening is Behaving Yourself. Behaving Yourself. And of course, I get that there from Psalm 101, verse 2, where it says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. So there is a way to behave yourself, and that's really what I want to talk about tonight. Now, if you would, keep something there in Psalm 101, but go ahead and turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. If you were here last Thursday, you'd recall that we went through uh, the, chap uh, the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. And doing a verse by verse uh, sermon through that. And you'll see the, sa the same concept come up there, if you recall, in 1 Timothy 3, chapter four, or verse 14, where it says, These things write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou, ought, uh, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So there is a way that we ought to behave ourselves, you know, not just in life in general, which is what we're going to talk about, but specifically here as well in church. There's a way we ought to behave ourselves in church. Now, of course, we went through many of those behaviors this last Thursday when we talked about the qualifications for the pastors and the deacons. I mean, that's kind of what Paul is saying. He says, these things write I unto thee, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself. So those behaviors that we read of in 1 Timothy chapter 3, those are behaviors that we ought to have in our own life uh, in order that we might you know, behave in a correct manner or behave as we ought to. So <coughs> they are required of them you know, if, because of the fact, you know, th those behaviors are required of a, of a pastor or of a deacon because why? As we talked about on Thursday. Because they are the examples. It's not just because God wants to put an extra burden on them or make them stand out. He wants them to be examples of the believers so that others would learn to do those same behaviors. So those, and I won't rehearse all of those things. Uh, obviously, we just preached about that on Thursday. But there are also some real practical things that we could uh, learn from this verse. Practical things that we need to be reminded of as how we ought to behave ourselves in the church of God. You know, and there's, there's a, a lot of things we could probably talk about, but you know, it's just some of the things that come to mind right out of the gate you know, would be probably in regards to children. You know, we have a lot of kids. And kids in church need to learn how to behave themselves. You know, there, there's a time and place to run and play. But, you know, when, church, when you're in church, church is not the place for children to be running around and wreaking havoc. Now, here, we're a little bit of a smaller group. It's not a big a deal. We have a little bit more room. They should still learn how not to do that. I mean, my kids are here, obviously, all day. You know, they... they so when, when we're out soul winning, and we'll, you know, from the time we get back, they have a few hours where they can just, I mean, they can flip the chairs, they can you know, run up and down the piano. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, they have a little bit more. They need to get that out. You know, they need to be able to run and allow to what they do, uh, to do what they want to do. But when church starts, when it's church time, when people are coming in, you know, kids need to stop running around. They need to, to mind their manners, and they need to not be you know, uh, a nuisance or even, make, can I say this, a danger. You know, this is something that you start to deal with when you get into a bigger a church, especially if it's a tighter space, you know, and, and there's not a lot of move, room to run, uh, move around. You know, when you have kids running around, that can be a real danger. Right. You know, it's something we're always having to correct in Phoenix. Stop your, you know, stop running, stop running, stop running. And people constantly have to be reminded of. But that is one way we could apply this. Say, hey, kids ought to behave in the house of God. What's another thing that kids need to do? Kids need to learn how to sit still during a sermon and pay attention, as well as adults, right? And, but we should learn that as children. And one thing that they, could, they also need to learn to do is to not be getting up during a sermon. You know, I understand if there's an emergency or something like that, but a lot of times kids, you'll see this, they'll just get up in the middle of a sermon and go get a glass of water. They're not thirsty. They're bored. You know, and we try to be, as, pre as preachers, try to be as dynamic as we can and try to preach sermons that are going to be engaging. But, you know, you can only... A lot of kids, you know, unless you're shooting lasers out of your eyeballs and juggling sticks of fire, you're not going to hold their attention for very long. Right. I mean, it's, it, we're up against some stiff competition. You know, I'm not some digitized, you know, Pokemon character up here with, right. with, with flaming fire and, and everything else that goes on with all, all that. You know, so they have a real short attention span as it is, but it's up to us as parents to train our children to learn how to sit still, to pay attention, you know, it's gonna, it's, Johnny's going to be okay if he has to go 30 minutes without a glass of water. Yep. You know, because here's the thing, it's distracting. It's distracting to those around you more than anybody. You know, me, you know, I've, I've learned as a preacher and am still learning to not allow things to distract me. But I'm not going to say it never happens. 
You know, we try hard to not let that happen and, to, to, and we want to minimize distractions. But we also, on the, on the, on the, from the preacher side too, we don't want to try and preach in a vacuum. You know, end up like being one of these preachers that just can't have any kids around us anywhere. You know, and if somebody makes a peep, it's like it just throws off, off our game. But that being said, we should still strive to have our children behaving in the house of God. And those are just some practical things that we could apply here. You know, bathroom breaks, you know, people can, can wait a little bit longer. I know there's certain circumstances where these type of things, you know, we don't want any accidents out there. But a lot of times, you know, people are just getting up and moving around just because that's what they want to do. Because they're just a little stir crazy or whatever it is. But that's not proper behavior in the house of God. We need to learn how to behave ourselves, not running around, sitting still, paying attention, and giving our undivided attention to what's being preached. I mean, that's why we came to church, I'd assume, right. is to hear the preaching of the Word of God. That's why we would bring our families and our kids. It only makes sense that we actually, once we got them here, to actually have them pay attention and listen to what's going on. <coughs> so, but I really want to focus in on that, really, on, on the practicalities of what we need to do. Because I think as a church, we, we have a pretty good grasp of that. You know, we understand, I mean, everyone here is pretty helpful. You know, they, 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 you know, they do things uh, for one another. They help out cleaning and stuff like that. So, you know, we've got that pretty much down. But this is just going to be kind of a reminder to us that we need to be careful how we behave ourselves, not only in the church of God, house of God, but outside the house of God. Because there is a way to just behave in life <coughs> in general, right? So what we want to start out with is, is how not to behave. A lot of times you can figure out, well, what, what is good behavior? Well, let's identify bad behavior, right? That's usually a good place to start. Identify what are bad habits, what are bad behaviors to have, and then avoid that, and we'll probably be headed in the right direction of good behavior. So <laughs> we need to learn how to behave in life in general because of the fact that how you behave outside of the church is going to affect how you behave inside the church. Right. You know, we should not be these type of people that just show up on Sunday and we're one way, and then once, once we're done with services, we go home, and then the rest of the week, we're just a totally different person. You know, our behavior is unbecoming of, of, of a Christian. We should be living the Christian life seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That should be who we are. It shouldn't just be a switch that we turn off and on. Amen. I'm in church today. Let me put on my church face and put on my church clothes and go act like I'm, like I'm expected to act at church. And then when I get back out in the world, you know, I forget, I forget that, well, that man and just go on the way I was. You know, how you behave the rest of the week is going to show up in here as well. How you are out in the world is going to show up even in church. So look there in Psalm 101, verse 1. What's one of the first behaviors or bad behaviors that we should try to avoid in our lives? It says, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, I will sing. I will behave myself in a perfect way. Now, right out of the gate, you know, this is just not in the notes, but there's a good behavior, singing. You know, that would probably help a lot of people in their, in their life from day to day if they would just learn to sing and praise the Lord. Amen. You know, just having a song in their heart, just having, you know, praise unto our God on their lips, you know, that would probably correct a lot of attitudes. If we find ourselves down in the dumps or getting a bad attitude, if we would just stop and just praise the Lord, it would probably remind us, you know, to count our many blessings. You know, you sing that song, I don't know how you can't, you can walk away with that song with a bad attitude after that. Yeah. It reminds us that we should be counting our blessings. But what I want to focus in here is verse 2 where it says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. So he's saying, I'm going to walk within my house with a per perfect heart. So there is a way to behave in God's house. There's also a way to behave in your house. There's, there's habits that you need to uh, avoid outside of the church. There's habits you need to uh, have in your life outside of the church. You need to have these things in your house as well. And one of those things he says is, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. And here's a great truth. What you watch affects your eyes. The Bible says, mine eye affecteth mine heart. Yeah. You know, the things that you look at, the things that you watch, the things that you let in through your eye, those things are going to affect your heart and they're going to affect the way you behave. I mean, is it, and it, it, it's no coincidence if we watch something that's got a lot of cussing in it. You know, if we hear a lot of filthy language, just mark it down. We're going to be cussing. Right. You know, it's going to come out of our mouth because we're used to it. And, you know, those of us that have gotten saved later in life, you know, unfortunately, this is more of a struggle for some people than others. Yep. You know, I remember growing up when dad visited, you know, my folks were split up. And when he would visit, you know, we was down to the video store. 
and it was every, every action movie saga under the sun. Every Rambo, every lethal weapon, every predator, every alien, just one, two, and three, every sequel, and it was just, we'd sit down and we'd just watch him nonstop. That was like something he just loved to do. And let me tell you something, there was a lot of filth, and there was a lot of just wickedness, and there was a lot of just dirty talking going on in that, those movies. And that's something that, you know, affected my heart. I remember you know, as a young man, growing up as a <coughs> child even, just having these, these dirty words. And they come out, and if we're not careful, these things still continue to show up. The Bible says, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. You know, the things that come out of your mouth are going to affect the way you behave. You know, if you're just going to turn and start cussing like a sailor, and, and saying dirty things and telling dirty jokes, it's going to affect your mind. And it might even get to the point where it starts to affect your, 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 your behavior. You know, when you start to say things, make crude jokes, and next, next thing you know, well, it's just a joke. And maybe you'll actually participate in some sin. You just make some lewd joke about some crude sin. And after you do that long enough, you're around that kind of thing long enough, it desensitizes you to it. And that's what television does, you know, and, and people, they can make that decision for themselves. I understand that every television comes with an off button, you know, that you can, you have some control over it, but I, I just, I don't have one, you know. Now, that's not to say that I don't watch anything. Obviously, I have, you know, every, a lot of people today still, I don't have a television, but it's not because they're trying to live some godly life. It's because they're pulling the plug on cable and everyone's going to internet, you know, they've all got, you know, com laptops and computers and smartphones and that's how we take in a lot of things. But here's the nice thing about those devices versus, say, cable television, is the fact that you have some control about what you're going to watch. You know, you're not going to have some commercial coming on. A lot of times the things that we watch, even on TV, are not necessarily bad. It's everything that they stuff in between. Yep. It's all the, the cutaways to, you know, the, uh, the bikini babe, you know, holding the, the fight card right. in your UFC fights, right? I like to watch UFC, but I know for between rounds, it's, you better look somewhere else. Right. You know, because they got some girl up there who looks like she needs a large pizza and a trench coat, right. you know, and walking around with a, uh, with a, with a card. Yeah. Or it's the cheerleaders on the side of, the, uh, uh, of the, the football game or something like that. They're always cramming that stuff in there. They're always trying to find a way to get that in front of your eyes. Some wicked thing to get you to lust, to get you to covet, to get you to desire things that aren't yours, that you don't have any business wanting or looking at. Right. So... Go ahead and turn, keep something in Psalms 101, but go over, over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. What you watch, the things that you entertain yourself with, those behaviors that you engage in are going to affect your behavior. They're going to come out in the way you conduct yourself. The Bible says, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. I mean, that's, that's some heavy language right there. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Those are the type of things that we should be saying and coming out of our mouths, things that edify one another and build us up in Christ. Now, I know we all like to sit around and cut up and joke and, and everything like that, and I think that's fine. But when, it's, when we start to get into that realm of saying things that are actually bringing others down. When we're actually corrupting other people with our language or with our speech or the, with the things that are coming out of our mouth are actually affecting people's minds and hearts in a negative way. You know, we ought to avoid that. We ought to get as far away from that as we can. And that type of thing is going to happen if what we're letting into our heart is, is corrupt. If you let something corrupt into your heart, you know, it's going to come out of your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know, those things which come out of a man, they defile a man. So if we're just filling our heart with the worldliness and the wickedness that's out there and all the corrupt things and all the wicked and evil things, it shouldn't surprise us when those same things start to come back out. <coughs> you know, and we can keep a cap on it. You know, it, we can put a cap on that when we're in church, you know, for a few hours on Sunday. But what if we were to go around week to week, just day in and day out with one another? I wonder how many things we might hear. You know, hopefully not. Because here's the thing, if you, if you set these wicked things before your eye, go ahead and turn back to Psalms 101. Psalms 101. He says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Now that's interesting language that he uses there, that it shall not cleave to him. See, wicked things that you set before your eyes, those things cleave to you. They don't, it's not like you just turn off the TV and you forget them. The things that you see on television, the imagery that we see the th and the hear 
and the way it engages the mind and the brain, it will cleave to you. I mean, why is it that I saw a movie when I was 15 and I could still get up to you and practically quote that? That we can all sit around and have and, and, and bring up movies from the 90s and the 80s and make these references. We all remember them. I haven't seen those movies in a decade. Some song will come. You'll be in a supermarket or somewhere and you'll hear some song come on the radio. You could sing along to it. You haven't sung it in years. It's because those things reach out and they cleave to you, right? So that's why we have to be really careful about the things that we let in because it's not just as simple as we like to think that, well, I'm just going to watch this today, turn it off, and forget about it. It's going to cleave to you, my friend. And, 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 and eventually, it's going to come back out. That's why these old movies, these old songs, they're so easily recollected, you know. But uh, go over to, keep something in Psalms 101 all night, but go over to Psalms uh, chapter 19. Now, if those things are in there, they're in there. You know, we've had the past that we have. We've watched the things that we've watched. We've heard and seen the things that we've heard and seen. You can't change that. But really what we should try to be doing is to replace those things. And, and I want to get ahead of myself, but a lot of times people, what they do is they withdraw from that and then they just create a vacuum. Like they just remove the wickedness that's there, but they don't replace it with anything. And if they don't do that, what's going to happen is that's going to just suck them back in. And they're just going to go right back into it because there's nothing there to keep them out. So in Psalm 19, look at verse 14. He says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in my sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. My redeemer. So we should be meditating on things that are pleasing to God. We should be, uh, let the words that come out of our mouth, they should be pleasing unto God. How is that going to happen if the meditation of your heart is right? You know, if you're thinking on godly things, if you're thinking about holy and righteous things, that's what's going to come out of your mouth. So it's not enough to just say, well, I'm not going to watch this stuff. I'm not going to put these wicked things in front of my eyes and that's it. You have to move on to something else. You know, you have to take the, 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 the turn the rock station off, you know, and per turn on the King James Bible. You can't just turn it off and not listen. I mean, if you can, great. But it, you're going to have a lot harder time not going back to it if you don't replace it with something. It's just like people want to give up pop, right? So many people do this. They give up pop. They're, I'm only going to drink water. Not everybody can just do that. Sometimes they still need that fizzle. They still need that sensation. They still need to hear that on the can, right? And they end up drinking those things right there, the LaCroix, right? <laughs> but hey, if that keeps you off the pop, you know, great. You know, people need to, you know, they want to give up their alcohol. But the same thing, you know, they, 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 they just want to go cold turkey. No, you probably ought to replace it with something. You know, something, I'm not saying go get a non-alcoholic beer, right. you know, but g replace it with something that satisfies some of those cravings that you have that are just inert things that have just been drilled into you. So that's one way we need to watch our behavior, that we should not be, uh, you know, just letting wicked things into our heart and into our mind because those things affect our behavior and, and they're going to affect our whole life. So <laughs> what's another way that we should be uh, behaving, specifically how not behaving, things that we should not be getting involved with uh, from our data in our day-to-day -day life. How about this? Don't keep company with wicked people. Don't keep company with wicked people. Our best friends in the world should not be ungodly, unsaved people. I'm not saying you can't have unsaved friends, but I'm just saying that they should not be, you know, your confidants in life. They should not be those that you go to counsel for and and, and things like just some, you know, obviously we all have parents and there's wisdom there that we can glean from them. But I'm just saying in general, you know, your, your buddy at work shouldn't be your, be, you know, your unsaved buddy who just wants to go out and drink after work probably shouldn't be your best friend. And all the, thi the only thing he has to talk about is worldliness and ungodliness. You know, that guy's probably not to be the, your, your best buddy. I'm not saying you can't be friends to them, be a witness to them, be a light unto them. But we shouldn't make wicked people especially. Now, obviously, unsafe people are not necessarily just wicked. But there's some time, there's time, I've known people that go out and make friends and they're pal around with wicked people. I'm saying wicked people. People that hate God. Christians that get saved out of the world, right? And, but they still keep their old friends. And some of those old friends hate God. So, you know, people that are, like, here's an example. If you have sodomites that are your old friends, you need to get rid of those friends. You need to have nothing to do with them right. because those wicked people are going to affect your behavior negatively. Right. Bad company equals bad behavior. Mark it down. And the worse people that you hang around, the worse you yourself are going to behave. Here's the concept. The, the, bad, the good never make the bad good. 
Never. You won't find that in Scripture. Where you have good people making bad people better. What you see a lot of is bad people making good people worse. I mean, go read about the children of Israel. That's what happens time and time and time again. They start getting involved with the heathen of the land, and then they go into full-blown idolatry, and God has to chasten them. It's the same thing today, friend. If you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, and you start hanging around the wicked, ungodly people and making them your, your circle of friends, they're going to drag you down. Uh, go ahead and turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 13, a very familiar story, but one that needs to be repeated to remind us these stories aren't just in there for filler. These are principles that we have to get down in our life and understand. 2 Samuel chapter 13, of course, is the story of Absalom, the son of David. Now, Absalom had a wicked desire in his heart for his half-sister. You know, he wanted to have her physically. And he knew that he couldn't act on that. He knew it was wicked. And it says here in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1, And it came to pass after this, that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed, vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. So yeah, he loves this girl, but he knows that it's not right. That it's improper. That it's his half-sister, that she's a virgin, you know, she's a maiden of Israel, and he doesn't want to do anything. He thought it hard. Why was he so vexed and, and, and sick? Because he, he, as much as he desired her, he knew it would be wrong. He said... It said that he hard, thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But what's the next verse say? But Amnon had a friend. And many a sad story in a Christian's life could begin that way. But so-and-so had a friend. Right. They kept that one sodomite pal around. You know, and, and, I've, and I've <laughs> you say that doesn't happen. It happens. And, and it seems like they have, you know, this happens to, I, I've, I've seen this happen more with women than with men. You know, they're out in the world, they have, because women, they don't only see how sodomites for what they are. Because they're very, just, we've talked about this already, that they're very, women are very trusting in nature, they think the best of people, you know, generally speaking. Obviously, people develop discernment and things like that. But, so when they get saved, and all these, these friendly, they're, they're gay friends at work, you know, all of a sudden, they're trying to shake them. They're try and they have a hard time doing it. You know, they're like, oh, I don't know how, he, that he can't get the message that I don't want to go shopping with him anymore, that I don't care what his opinion on shoes are, or whatever it is that these, these fags want to, you know, <laughs> what they do when they're hanging out with their girlfriends. Right. But they have a hard time shaking them. You know, if they don't learn to do that, it, it's going to affect them, you know. And, and the same thing with guys, you know, if, even if guys were hanging around a bunch of, I don't know any normal guy that wants to hang around with another fag. That's right. You know, some dude who wants to is into whatever you know that's just to me that's just weird especially as a christian right. i mean let alone just being a straight guy you know it, it's just it would, it would it's it's odd yeah. to begin with but you know they had they keep these these people around these amnons in their life and they start to drag them down now it doesn't have to be even a sodomite i mean it could just be some ungodly worldly wicked person I mean, I've worked around guys you know in the field different fields i've been in i've been around some real roughnecks and I'll tell you what, hanging out with them 12 hours a day, going out of town, having to work, you know, sleep in the same hotel rooms, eat every meal with them, see them all day, they, it starts to have an effect on you true. being around those people. They'll, it'll, it'll start. Next thing you know, you're like, well, you know, maybe if I could just go to the bar with them tonight and just not drink. And first you do that. Now, I, thank God I've never done that. You know, I didn't. <laughs> but what if I had stayed around, hung around long enough? What if no one had ever taught me this? Maybe I thought, well, what's so wrong about that? Then, you know, you know, what's wrong with Amnon? He just seems like a nice guy. You know, they just want to hang out and shoot the breeze. Next thing you know, you're at the bar and you know it's a soda water, and then you're like, well, you know, one drink's not going to hurt. And next thing you know, you're thrown back with them and you're you're stumbling out in the parking lot. Who knows? There's so many different examples we could talk about. But the point being that if you keep bad company, it's only a matter of time until bad behavior follows. And that's what we see with Amnon. This so-called so friend, Am, or excuse me, Amnon, who had a friend whose name was jo, uh, Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother. And what does it say about him? He was a very subtle man. That's an attribute of Satan. He was the most subtle animal, you know, beast of the field, right? The serpent. He was very subtle in his dealings. And that's what wicked people are like. They don't just come out and say, hey, I'm a wicked person, and I'm here to destroy your life. 
I'm going to drag you down with me. Is that what they do? No, they're very subtle. You know, and they probably don't even consider themselves to be that bad. You know, they're, they're, they're like pathological liars. They, they believe themselves, they, they, they've got themselves so convinced that they're, they're good people that they believe it. And that's why they're so good at convincing others. But they drag people down. You know, they're not obvious. Now go ahead and turn over to Genesis chapter 9, another familiar story. <coughs> Genesis chapter 9, verse 18, I'll begin reading. <coughs> and the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and drank of the wine, and was drunken. Now, shame on Noah. Right. You know, he should have not have been doing that. He should not have been making wine and getting drunk. But he was, okay? And he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. <coughs> now, this story, some people want to say that nothing homo happened here, okay? But I believe that something did happen. Something physically happened to him, that Ham uh, uh, physically violated his father, assaulted him, all right? But I believe, well, it doesn't say that exactly in text. Yeah, because I believe that Noah, being the man of God that he was, God is trying to spare him a little of embarrassment. You know, he's trying to kind of, just kind of let us know, hey, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, this yeah. is what happened. I don't want to just come out and say it about Noah. He's trying, because obviously Noah's a real guy. Right. You know, and this, these are the eternal pages of scripture. Right. And everyone's going to know this story about Noah. <coughs> so my belief is that something physical did happen, because it goes on and says, <coughs> verse 23, And Ham and Shapheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine now here's where, here's where you, you get the, 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 the nudge from God. And knew what his younger son had done unto him. So he, he woke up and said, something happened to me. Somebody has done something to me. And he finds out who it was. That it, he, he finds out it was something that his younger son had done unto him. And he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brother. I mean, whatever was done unto him, it was enough for him to get out of his tent and say, cursed be Canaan. Right. And cursed his own son. I mean, that's not just, you know, dad's robe fell open and I saw more than I cared to. Right. You know, that's, that's him cursing his son because something had been done unto him. So you don't have to agree with that. You know, I, for a long time I had a tr didn't necessarily agree with that, but I've come around on that and I think that is, in fact, what's going on here. And really what we can learn from this is that bad company and alcohol are a bad mix. Yeah. If you start mixing bad company with subtle people and you start mixing alcohol into the equation, bad things are going to happen to you. I mean, I, we all probably have horror stories, either in our own lives or from other people. I mean, I could tell you stories about, other, from, I don't know, from other people, just the worst things happening to them, getting raped because of hanging around the wrong people and, and mixing alcohol. You don't want that in your life, but that's what happens out there, and people need to be reminded that you need to mind your behavior. The habits that you get involved in and the people that you keep company with can have devastating effects on your life. <coughs> the Bible says in Habakkuk, I'll read to you, woe unto him, okay, him. Okay, that's, that's male. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor to drink, that putteth thy bottle to him. So it's a him putting his bottle to him, right? Two dudes. That, uh, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. I mean, there again, just another pr proof text showing us that when you start mixing alcohol and wicked people, nothing good comes of it. Bad things happen. Really uh, weird stuff. And there's people that have absolute horror stories. Things that they, they got drunk around the wrong people and had advantage taken, and they were taken advantage of. And they have to live with that, you know, and they have to try and live that down. That's tough. Now, <coughs> so we see that, you know, keeping company with wicked people is just not a good idea. And, uh, and, and, and we should not be keeping company with people that are wicked individuals. And we definitely don't want to be mixing al alcohol in the equation as well. Amen. But let's just move along in here for the sake of time. What's another uh, type of people that we should not keep company with? We should not be keeping company with people who talk a lot of trash. Okay? Now let me just come out and say this. This is not the same as expressing a concern about somebody. 
Because this is something that gets blurred. A lot of people, they take this to the, a, a complete opposite extreme and say, I can never say anything critical about anybody ever. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about here. It's not about expressing a legitimate concern to somebody. But we also have to watch out for people that just want to go around and talk trash about people. And this happens. This happens in churches where people just live to go around, talk trash about you know, the preacher, the pastor, whoever, talk about his wife, talk about so-and-so, the church member, their wife, whatever. And all they want to do is just stir up strife and, and contention. So we don't want to fall into that type of company either. Go ahead and turn over to uh, Proverbs chapter 25. Ch Proverbs chapter 25. <clears throat> and really what this stems from, when you have somebody who's just going to start talking trash about other individuals, whether it's warranted or not, whether they, uh, what it's really coming from is a high look and a proud heart. The Bible says, Whosoever privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart, I, will I not suffer? That's what we read in Psalms 101. So we see it's coming out of a high look and a proud heart. And really what it is, is we try to bring others down to exalt ourselves. And we've seen this time and time again, you know, being involved with ministry, where people just want to bring down others so that they can exalt themselves. <coughs> and how do you handle that? So how do you handle that when somebody is going to come to you and start talking trash and trying to bring another person down? You know, not saying, hey, I have a legitimate concern about this person, here, X, Y, and Z, you know, and, and just looking for counsel. But just going, hey, did you know about so-and-so? Did you know what they're involved in? D can you believe that? You know, and just try, you know what I mean? It's a, there's a difference there, okay? How do you handle that when somebody comes to you and, and, and does that? Look at Proverbs 25, verse 23. There's one way to handle it. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. You know how you handle that? You give them a dirty look. You know, you say, what do you, we're, you know, we're, hey, I don't want to hear that. You know, well, really, let's go talk to them. And you can tell me all about it in front of them. And we can talk about it. You know, we've done this. You know, <laughs> my wife has done this. You know, I, I, I reminded me of an example. We ha there was a person, a lady, you know, she doesn't go to Phoenix Church anymore. This is years ago. But she had developed, she developed a reputation for being a backbiter. Somebody just went around, talked smack about ladies, you know, would say things, go to other uh, men's wives and say, hey, you know, your husband's looking at me the wrong way. What? Wicked, right? These are bad things. <laughs> Trying to divide, make div uh, divisions in a marriage. This is not good. This type of thing happens at a church. And again, this is preventative, okay? If this type of thing ever happens, this is how you handle it. You get the, you get the angry countenance. Because a person like that, they just want you to go, oh, really? Okay. And they just want to get an ear so they can just start to fill it and just start filling your heart with the same animosity. Okay? So the, 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 the angry countenance is how you handle it. And that's what my wife did. We had this, uh, had this lady over, a couple and another couple over at our house for dinner. And my wife was, you know, down the little hallway a little bit. And she overheard this woman whispering ever so slightly about so-and-so. And did you know about so-and-so? And this is a new, and she's saying this to a younger, newer Christian who had just come to the church. And she starts, starts it up again, okay? And what did my wife do? I mean, she walked right up and she's like, you're not going to be talking about smack. She did like the whisper yell thing. You know, you know what I'm talking You're not going to come in here, talk, talk white, talk crap and something like that. You know, she's, she, she nipped it right in the bud. And of course, she's like, oh, I wasn't talking about so-and-so. I wasn't doing that. She's like, okay, well, we'll go there tomorrow and you can say exactly right. what you just said to their face. And then it was like, oh, I'm sorry. Please, please forgive me, you know. Right. And we did. We got over it. You know, and it's not an example I'm bringing up just, you know, for, just for the sake of it. It's, it's an, a perfect example of how to handle this type of a thing. That when somebody comes to you and they're not, they're not coming at you of a genuine concern, but they're just wanting to just fill your heart with animosity towards somebody that's how you handle it right there when they're trying to just talk trash and, and and pit people against each other now go back to psalm 101 if you kept something there so the the point is this you know we need to keep comp uh, careful of the company uh, we got to keep we have to be careful of the company that we keep and i'm trying to get it out we have to be careful of the company that we keep because the company that we keep will affect our behavior whether it's a drunk whether it's just a subtle, wicked person, whether it's somebody who just wants to talk a bunch of trash and be a gossip, we have to be careful of these people. And these are the type of things that, 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 that pop up in a church. 
And he's and so we understand now what to look out for. Okay, what not to to be allowing into our lives, but what should we allow into our lives? Well, look here in Psalm 101, verse 6. He says in Psalm 101, verse 6, Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, sh he shall serve me. So instead of, you know, having our eyes upon the wicked of the land and keeping company with wicked people and subtle people and bad people, we should be actually keeping our eyes upon the faithful of the land. And that's why it's great when our fellowship outside of church involves people from church. Amen. You know, like I just heard about some fellowship that went on, you know, this Saturday. And quite frankly, I was a little jealous I wasn't there. <laughs> you know, I heard the wings were great. So, um, but I had some great wings at my house. Let me tell you, they were some of the best wings I've ever had. Oven baked, sticky, not saucy, oh. just a little crispy. Oh man, could eat, eat the whole thing. Anyway. But the company that, you know, when we our company and our fellowship outside of church involves people from church, that's you keeping your eyes upon the faithful of the land. Amen. Surrounding yourself with good Christian fellowship. <coughs> and it <coughs> so here's the thing. Again, you can't just go into this vacuum, right? If you've got wicked friends, if you have bad influences in your life, if you've got bad habits, it's yes, cut those things out, but you can't stop there. You can't just say, well, I'm not going to have anything to do with that anymore and just you know, just turn yourself into some kind of, you know, shut in, you know, and I'm just going to change my phone number or block those numbers and just, you know, not answer the door when they knock, whatever. You can't just ignore it and not, and not you have to replace it with something. You have to fill that void. Otherwise, you're just going to create a vacuum. And, you know, I kind of already allude, alluded to this, but one relationship that people have that they need to watch out for that has a major influence that has a lot of backbiting people one influence that has a lot of liars and slanderers and drunks and homos and wicked subtle people, one relationship that people have that has a lot of that in their life is television. It's the television. And I know I already kind of alluded to this, but you know, this kind of this illustration drives the point home. You know, what if I had what if I had set came to you and I said to you that, hey, I'm gonna I I my wife kicked me out. I've been having an affair. You know, I was lying to her, I was cheating on her, and I need a place to stay. So I'm going to come live in your house. Okay, and I only need one room. I just need one room in your house. That's all I need. But here's the thing. I'm going to stay there all day, every day. I'll be there every time you come home from work, and we can talk whenever you want. And you can spend all the time you want with me, right? And we can hang out, we can get to know one another. And, and here's, here's the best part. You're going to pay me to stay there. You're going to pay me to stay in that one room, and be there whenever you need me. And we could talk about anything. You want a dirty joke? I got, you know, we could talk dirty jokes. I, we could talk about filth. We could talk about whatever you want. You'd say, you're crazy. No way, Brother Corbin, ain't gonna happen, right? right? But here's the thing, that's exactly what a television does. Right. That's what I am. That's a TV. You, bring, you, you set that TV in there, that's the exact same thing. Now you've got somebody in your house that you're gonna pay, you know, last time I used that illustration, someone come and corrected me someone who actually installed uh, internet and cable and said it's actually more than 100 bucks. It's more like 200 bucks. There they said it's actually more, it's more expensive. So you're going to sit there and pay $200 for somebody to just pipe all that filth and trash into your living room. No, they're going to set up some filth funnel, the satellite right. up on your, on your rooftop. Just filter in all the filth. So you can just sit there and flip through and just take in all the ungodly worldliness. <coughs> so that's one behavior or one, uh, excuse me, that's one relationship in our life that people need to seriously examine. I mean, if we're sitting down and just watching whatever's coming across the screen, it, you know, that stuff's going to be affecting your mind. It's going to affect your heart, and it's going to affect your behavior. <coughs> the Bible says there in Proverbs, or excuse me, Psalm 101, where we are, verse 7, He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I only watch the news. You're listening to somebody that tells you lies. Yep. I only tune into Fox. You're filling yourself with lies. Right. Bunch of liars. I only watch Anderson Pooper, you know, Ra uh, Rachel uh, Mancow. Yep. You know, those, you know I, I watch them. Bunch of liars. Yeah, right. I only watch, you know, uh, Sean Insanity. Liar. Yep. You know, Rush Limbotomy. Liar. Right. They're just filling yourself, you know, all these <laughs> Bill O. No, Riley, right? I don't know. I didn't Bill think. <laughs> Bill Lyrie, thank you. <laughs> you know, all the pundits that are just brainwashing you with the, their agenda. Right. 
They're lying to you. I don't watch the filth. You know, I don't turn over to the Playboy channel. I don't watch all the ungodliness that's over there. I don't watch HBO and, and Cinemax and all that other filth. I only watch, you know, I only watch the news. You're still dwelling with people that are telling lies to you. And the Bible says here that the he shall, that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I'm not going to let him dwell and hang out and linger in my field of vision. You know, and it's not, and it's not, it's not, well, I'm just going to leave the room. He's leaving the room. Okay. It's going out. And again, I understand that, you know, I'm not saying that the device itself that's mounted on the wall is wicked. It's what comes across it. You know, people can have a television and control what's on there today. You know, growing up, it wasn't the case for us. You know, it was either antenna or cable. And, you know, or, or you got the, like the economy package, you know, 13 channels or whatever. That's what we had growing up. We had 13 channels. One of them was the learning channel. Didn't we come up with a good TLC acronym the other day? The lying channel. Yeah. Right? That was the lying channel where they're just, you know, more lies. And they're just filling yourself with lies. Well, it's a learning channel. What could be wrong with that? Lies. Lying to you about God. Lying to you about the Bible. Lying to you about evolution. PBS. What's a good acronym there? You know, the, uh, <laughs> I should have thought of this beforehand, right? It was off the cuff. Public uh, belial uh, <laughs> signal. I don't know. <laughs> you know, but PBS, what could be wrong with that? Oh, I don't know. They're lying to you. You know, evolution. The, it, yeah, evolution, all the other trash, the, the commie crap that comes across yeah. it. Right. So, you know, television is the one relationship that people really need to examine in their life yeah. and whether or not they should even have that. Now, what's the great thing today is that, yeah, you can have the device, but then you can hook up, you know, YouTube to it and you can put good preaching on it. You can watch a documentary. You could probably filter through and find some good, clean entertainment to put on there. You know, there's... Not every documentary has to be, you know, framing the world or, or from the new IFB movement. There are also other good ones out there. I highly suggest, I got a few I could suggest, you know. You know, the, the Shackleton's Voyage of the Endurance, you know. Narrated by Liam Nielsen. You can even get your Hollywood star in there if you <laughs> want it, right? I don't recommend that version. There's other ones out there. But those are, there's other great informative things that we could take in for entertainment other than, you know, watching, you know, the fifth season of, of Seinfeld for the third time or Cheers, or whatever wicked show that you want to, you know, Friends. I mean, they're still advertising Seinfeld. Did you know that? On billboards in, T in Phoenix. We've got rights to the reruns. Tune in, Wednesdays at 7. You know, and the, all these things that, that we could sit down and just start to fill our minds with. They affect our heart. You know, and I, and I get it. I mean, the allurement's there. Seinfeld's a funny guy. You know, I mean, there's some of those episodes were hilarious. But you know what? They start to affect our minds. They start to affect our heart. We start to think, oh, you know, sleeping around, it's not so bad. Oh, they just make, oh, it's no longer adultery, it's just an affair. Right. You know, it's just, it's, it, you know, and then there's the one, the what, now I'll admit, I was a Seinfeld addict, okay? You know, the one episode I didn't watch, Seinfeld uh, is putty as a Christian. Because I knew they were just going to mock, and it was, it was like the second to last, it was one of the last episodes they chose to air, and I already knew they're just going to mock Christianity to that whole thing so I just didn't watch it you know but that's not good enough <laughs> you know we all, we need to get that stuff out of our lives so there is a way that we should behave you know there's behaviors that we need to look out for and people that are going to influence our behavior we need to get rid of that those relationships whether they be wicked people whether that be through the television or actual physical interactions with other people that are wicked we need to get it out of there and there is a way that we should behave so we talked a lot about tonight about what we shouldn't be doing, right? And when we figure out what we shouldn't be doing, that usually gets us going in the right direction. When we start getting away from the thing, you know, these bad things, normally we're going to be heading in the right way. So, <laughs> what are some of the ways we should behave? Go ahead and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Beginning in verse 4, the Bible says, and we should all know this one, right? Some of you should know it really well. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. These should be the type of behaviors that we have in our life. We should try to emulate these things. 
You know, and if we're walking in the Spirit and we're living for God, these are the type of attributes that are going to begin to bear fruit in our lives. But it's not always going to just happen automatically. We have to check ourselves to sometimes and say, am I behaving unseemly? Am I seeking my own? Am I easily provoked? Am I thinking evil? Am I rejoicing in iniquity? Am I rejoicing in the truth? Am I bearing all things? Do I believe all things? Am I enduring all things? Am I suffering long? Am I being kind? Am I not envying? You know, we have to check ourselves with these and see how our behavior is lining up because this is the way we should be behaving. These are, should be things that are, are uh, you know, indicative of our character as Christians. So what is charity? You know, it's an old-fashioned word for love. Basically, charity is love. And that's an attribute that should define us. You know, if someone were to say, what, what is, you know, how, how, what, would, what would you say about so-and-so? I mean, could they say, well, he's a very loving person. She's a very loving individual. Could they look at your life and say, oh, that person cares about others. They love others. They're, they're more worried about others than themselves. You know, most of us, we could probably say that about everybody in the room. You know, people that want to go out and knock on some stranger's door and preach them the gospel. That's a very loving thing to do. You know, but there's a lot more to it than just that. You know, that's a good place to start, but there's a lot of other things uh, that we need to do to, where we show love. How about we should show, have love for the brethren, right? I preached a sermon about this a few months ago. The Bible says, and you don't have to turn there, 1 Peter chapter 2, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, notice that's a serious command because it's right, right between all, honor all men and fear God. Right? You have these two, you wouldn't just say, you wouldn't be flipping about that one. Well, fear God, you know, that's optional. Not optional. Right. But right before that, it says love the brotherhood. It's just as serious. Notice how serious a command that is to be in the same verse as fear God. So you can't, you, can't have lo you can't lack love for the brethren and say you fear God, right? Because that, that's a command. You know, well, you know, love the brotherhood, I don't really have to do that. Are you really fearing God at that point? Are you really worried about keeping God's commands if you're not keeping that one? Where we're supposed to be loving the brotherhood. The Bible says, I'll read to you in 1 John 4, go ahead and turn over to Romans 12. Romans 12, the Bible says in 1 John 4, If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this is the commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So loving the brotherhood is a serious command that we have to take very seriously. And it's not always easy to just love the brotherhood. Look, look here in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. I mean, don't let it be fake. Don't let it be simulated. You know, don't let it be just this, this hokey, fake love. Let it be real. And you know, we should weep with those that weep and rejoice with them that rejoice. And when we really get to know people, the brotherhood, and look, I'm not saying everybody in church has to be, you know, bosom buddies. But I mean, if you don't have anybody like that, like if you're not, you don't have to develop any kind of relationship, any kind of closeness with anybody in the church, are, you know, I'd say, are you really loving the brotherhood? Are you really in this to, to, to uh, you know, edify and love one another and to build the church up? Or are we just coming in to just, you know, check off, got church out of the way. I'm right with God this week because I went to church. Or is it I'm going there because I love these people. I want to help these, these people. I want to see God do something in this church. So he says there, let love be without dissimulation. Let it be real. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. There's that word again. In, instead of letting every, the wickedness and the worldliness cleave to us, we should be cleaving to that which is good. <coughs> be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another not slothful in business fervent in spirit serving the Lord rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation continuing instant in prayer so we see here that you know Rome, that Psalms 101 was kind of the negative right it was telling us to you know get rid of uh, to not letting the liars tarry in our sight to not let you know, the wicked people cleave uh, uh, unto us, you know, and to, and to get away from wickedness. And, and it was the negative side of, of our behavior, things that we should not be doing. But Romans 12 is the positive, isn't it? It's saying, you know, uh, uh, Psalm 101 was, set no, thing, uh, wicked thing, uh, set no wicked thing before mine eyes, it shall not cleave to me. But here we say, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. So again, this concept of not living in a vacuum, that's something I keep bringing up because that's how people end up so often going back to their old ways and not growing in this area. 
is because they're not making a concerted effort to actually improve here or getting rid of the bad and filling it with the good. So verse 10 there is, you know, kind of a tall order when you look at it. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. That's easier said than done sometimes, isn't it? When we're really being uh, in tribulation, when we're really being persecuted, we're really going through some tough time in our life, it's hard to just tell you, oh, just be patient. You know, we have to try to do that on our own. You know, the, the, the preacher just can't go up and say, oh, you need to be patient, and that's going to fix it. You have to make that effort. And it's easier said than done. This is a tall order. Patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. I mean, that takes discipline and thoughtfulness. Distributing necessity of the states given to hospita uh, hospitality. Excuse me. You know, we are to be uh, it, it, it kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. So that's a command there. And it's not always easy to do. In fact, there's going to be people that we find unlovable. And, you know, I've had my fair share of that over the years. Just that I don't, <laughs> this person is very unlovable. But the command is to love them all the same, isn't it? That is the command. And again, I'm not saying we have to bake them cookies and bring them flowers and, 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 and all of that. But we have to try to at least love the brethren. It's a command. Go over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. This is behavior. We're dealing with how we ought to behave ourselves. These are the type of behaviors we should have and should not have in our lives. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. You know, so often we just want to make it external. You know, not getting involved in XYZ sin. But a lot of our behavior has to deal with what's inside. What's going on in our heart and in our minds. Let all bitterness, look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. you. Now, notice he says there, let all bitterness. You need to let this happen. God plays a part in this. God, you know, if we're walking in the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, you know, uh, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, patience, these things will begin, the fruit of the Spirit will begin to abound in our life. And these things will start to happen to some degree on their own. We'll start to let notice the bitterness and the wrath and the anger starts to go away, the clamor, the evil speaking. But we need to let that happen. Some people fight that. They want to hang on to these things. They want to stay bitter. They want to have that wrath. You know, they want to have the anger. Because come on, sometimes when you're angry, man, you feel alive. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you ever get really mad? You feel like, you know, the heart's pumping. You know, if you feel alive. But we need to let these things go. And, and we need to let this happen. He says there, be kind one to another, tender hearted. You know, that's, that's not always, you know, something that we always have. Sometimes we have to have, it reminds me, when I read that, it reminds me of like, you know, like some pieces, like some cuts of meat are tougher than others. Some of them are really hard to bite through. And what do they do? They take a mallet a lot of times and they just beat that thing, right? To, to loosen that up, to, to mash that cut of meat, to make it more tender, right? more tender piece of meat. And sometimes that's what we need. Sometimes we need someone to just take the Bible and start to just, hey, you need to loosen up. You need to get more tender. You know, when you get in the Bible and prayer and let God just go, hey, you need to loosen up. You need to be more tender. And work on our, on our hearts because sometimes our hearts can they develop an unkind and unforgiving attitude. And that's an evidence of a hard heart. And we need to let the preaching and the reading and the Holy Spirit begin to loosen up our hearts and become tender-hearted people. Uh, forgiving one another. And you say, well, why? Why do I have to do all that? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That's why. Because, you know, if you're having a hard time in this area, just consider the offense that you were to God. And just think about that. That you were one time an enemy with God. And what if God decided to not be forgiving? What if God decided to stay bitter and wrathful and angry and, and not forgive you and not be tender hearted towards you when you were an offense to him. Where would that have left us? So again, not easy. These aren't easy behaviors, but they're necessary. And let me say this. If you're ever going to be considered for ministry, it's 100% necessary. You know, just going through and checking off the requirements of 1 Timothy 3, you know, and having gotten your marriage down and read your Bibles X, Y, Z times and, and had X many, amount of children, 
And going through that checklist, you can cross them all off, but if these attributes aren't in you, ministry's not for you because you'll fail and you'll ruin people. And, and it's, it's not what you want. <coughs> not easy, but commanded. These are the behaviors that we have to have. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. So that's the type of attitude we have to have, especially in, if we're going to go into ministry. Then we have to be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and in meekness, instructing others. So, <coughs> you know, it, it would help us, because that ver same verse, it goes on and it says, why, why is it you have to have those attributes, you know, of the, the servant of the Lord, of not being one that strives, but apt to teach, to be patient, to be meek in instructing those. If God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. That's why we have these behaviors. That's why we develop these attributes in our lives. So that others can recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. You know, if you've ever been snared in the devil, you should know it's not a fun place to be. It's not good. And when we see somebody else who's snared by the devil, our heart should go out to them to want to set them free. But that's going to require certain behaviors. And that's going to require us to have a gentle, apt, uh, apt uh, uh, teacher, be, to be gentle, to be patient, and in meekness, teaching and instructing others, to help them set them free from that, those snares. And you know, if we started to see others as that, if we actually had saw people as captives that are take, you know, of the devil, we would probably be more patient with them. And we would probably have more of these attributes toward them. If we could learn to see people like that, people who have been ensnared by the devil. You know, some people in life, they're just trying to recover from a life of sin. They're just trying to get their life in order. And we should be gentle towards those people. And we should be, uh, we should be willing to teach and instruct them, to help them to get away from the devil. And teach them things like this, how to behave. What behaviors they should avoid and what behaviors they should bring into their life. Because how others behave affects us. That's the great truth of the sermon. Why should we concern about how to behave ourselves? Because how you behave affects people, you know, for good or, or worse. And, and, and how we affect, uh, uh, how other people, I mean, think about it. How other people behave affect you. The way you behave affects others. So that's why we need to consider our, be our behavior, not just in regards to, you know, the external sins and iniquities and things that we should not be participating in, but also in our own hearts the attributes, the characteristics that we should be developing in our lives so that our behavior could be beneficial to others. Let's go ahead and pray.